A special warm greetings from the Christian Connect from myself, Dan and Russ. And I wanted to welcome you guys and I wanted to just say thank you guys for all your support and love. And please remember to download a video, subscribe, comment, share. This is a topic that I used to preach on and I was told to back off. And I will back off because I realized that this is all built in. Um, any, any Christian can pick this up. It's called wisdom, discernment, the Lord will give it to you. So Rossin is going to talk today about the false doctrine. So this is part 10, handing straight over to Rossin. Oh, and by the way, we love you guys. We love you, but Jesus loves you more. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, brothers and sisters, welcome. And uh, once again, very excited to be together and on this journey. And uh, we appreciate you. We love you. And... Uh, We'll continue part 10 today. Um, I hope you enjoy the series. We still not finished yet, but we are wrapping up now. We are on part 10. And today um, we're going to deal with something that is very important. Um, at some point we are required to stand our ground and to defend the faith. And since we are living in the end times, right at the end, um, we need to defend the gospel, including, the gospel includes defending the end times prophecies. Um, what do I mean? You may ask, okay, um, what does the gospel has to do with the end times uh, prophecy and the return of the Lord? In my opinion, it has a lot to do with that. Um, and uh, let me remind you that the good news is not only about how to be saved, but the good news is the return of Jesus Christ. And the prophecies that we looked at are leading up to exactly that event. And to remind ourselves that part, I'm going to read for you now Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. And I read, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that we might redeem that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous for good works the underlying paragraph emphasis added looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus Christ. You have you noticed what the blessed hope is? The glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. Since I start telling the people that I know of believers and unbelievers that we live right in the end times and they should pay attention to God's prophecies, I had very negative um, response from many believers and I used to think that either they don't recognize the prophecies they don't believe them or there's something wrong with me the way that I tell them and none of us is insured against pride selfishness and the way we speak to people granted but later on the Lord showed me the reason that many churches don't preach the, good, uh, the end times, the book of revelations and prophecies is, um, besides the ones that I've discussed with you, is that they want to keep the status quo. They like it here on earth. They've got plans here on earth. A lot of their hopes and ambitions are still in this world. They look, they, their focus is not heavenwardly, it's earthly. And this is a sad reality. And I believe for some of those who are like that, the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 
he will catch you unawares. And sometimes you hear them say, oh, but you must be ready like the Lord will come today. Uh, you mustn't worry about end times. That sounds so nice to hear it. However, they're using that to tell you, don't preach to us about it. We want to hear something else. But here's the thing now. What do you think happens to the saints that have already passed on, that have died and are in heaven? What are they waiting for? Do they have a resurrected body? No. They are waiting even in heaven for Christ's return. Exactly. So that the resurrection, the first resurrection is for Christians with eternal bodies. Even they are waiting for that. And that is the blessed hope. So yes, brothers, don't ever be slandered about, about telling the people to repent because the prophecies of the end times are being fulfilled in our own time. Don't shy away from it. Speak boldly the truth. The Lord's return is the most important event for us believers because we shall be like our Lord. He will give us bodies like His and we're going to be united with Him forever. Hallelujah. Um, now we're going to deal with the false doctrines about the end times. We need to defend the faith. Okay. God willing. We'll challenge these false doctrines together now. Um, false doctrines about the end times and the Lord's return. And I will start with the less harmful ones. I'll focus on four and move to the hard ones. Okay, number one, it goes like this. The Lord will not return before the gospel is preached in the whole world. So we will still have plenty time for there is, uh, to evangelize, there is many places that are not reached. And the scripture they use for that is Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It sounds so nice, this, uh, this uh, doctrine. It sounds like, yes, uh, perhaps there is truth in it. There's many unreached places and we've got the great commission to preach the good news. On the face of it, it looks perfect. But at a closer look, there is something that is not quite right. And to explain to you uh, what is wrong with that doctrine, I need to go a little bit back. And I want to ask you, in Matthew 24, what is the original question that I asked Jesus? Um, what did they ask him, the disciples, in order for Jesus to give them the whole end times discourse in Matthew 24? And I will read for you Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 to 3. That's how it, it began. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temples. And Jesus said unto them, See you not, uh, see you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, they shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Have you noticed? When will this happen? Happen what? The destruction of the temple. That was their first question. Secondly, what will be the sign of your coming? There we go. End times. And thirdly, um, when the world that we know will end, the world that is ruled by Satan and mankind. So now, I want you to remember that the discourse that Jesus gave, he answered few questions with one discourse. When the temple will be destroyed, when the world will end as we know it, and when, what will be the sign of his coming. But then I want you to also bear in mind that he was speaking to two groups. The temple symbolizes Israel, the pride of Israel. So he was answering a question when actually the destruction of Israel 
will happen. And when his return will be for Israel, because the disciples were not only Christians, but they were Israelis too. Then secondly, they also represented the church because they were Christians. So again, the question included Christians. When are you coming for us? So it's remarkable that Jesus managed to answer all those five questions actually in one discourse, including when he's coming for the church and when he's coming for Israel. Um, for example, do you know that we can work out his second coming to the day? Do you know how? Very simple. He said in Daniel chapter 12, when you see that the abomination of desolation is placed in and the sacrifice has been abandoned in the temple, which speaks about the midpoint of the tribulation when Antichrist goes in and proclaims himself for God and stops the sacrificial system. Then shall be 1,290 days and blessed are those that survive until the 1,335 days. So we know exactly that from the time Antichrist goes into the temple to proclaim himself as God, there will be exactly 1,000 335 days until Jesus is appearing. Bingo! So, definitely that is the answer that for Israel, because Israel will be, the remnant of Israel will be in the wilderness, and they will be looking forward to Jesus' return during the second half of the tribulation. However, what we don't know when his return is, is to the church. Because no one knows the day and the hour. You see, that answer has nothing to do with Israel now and his physical return. It has to do with the rapture. Have you noticed now what I've explained to you? That Jesus was answering two distinct groups. Those who represent Israel and he was giving them an answer. And those representing the body of Christ, the church. So to decode this uh, um, false doctrine that basically there's so many unreached places. The doctrine actually, if you explore it further, it states that the church will be here until the whole world is evangelized and only then Jesus can return. Well, I've got a bad news. Firstly, the world is not going to get evangelized. In fact, according to the scripture, if you look of, uh, into 1 Thessalonians, sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3, uh, 1 Timothy 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4, it speaks about apostasy and rebellion. The world is going down. That day cannot come until the apostasy comes first and then the son of perdition shall come in, meaning the Antichrist. So does that sound like a world that has been evangelized? Not definitely. So, um, you may say, oh, okay, evangelizing, preaching the gospel to all nations, reaching them and then believing are two different things. Granted. But what I'd like you to understand is that Paul specifically says that there will be a rebellion and the church will be apostate at the time of Christ's return. And it's exactly the times we live in. The Laodicean church, the lukewarm church, predominantly. Okay. So... Uh, who will complete the Great Commission? Not the church. The second thing that they forget in this doctrine is that the tribulation on its own has players that will complete the commission. The commission for the church is to preach until Jesus takes his bride home. That is our commission, the church. So we can never reach everyone to the farthest corners of the earth. But now we looked at the end time series together and I've shown you that the two prophets of God, the 144,000 and the angels of God will preach the gospel to every tongue and language and peoples around the world and no one will be able to stop them. So they will complete the Great Commission. So you see they're using this doctrine to excuse themselves for building an empire, a church empire on their own. 
That's the very reason why the prosperity gospel came in. That's the very reason now that they speak about the billionaires clap, clap for Christ. Can you believe something? Become a billionaire clap for Christ and with money we're going to reach the ends of the earth. Absolute nonsense. So what I'm trying to say is that the doctrine is inaccurate. Yes, we need to aim to reach everyone in the world. But it will reach a point in which Jesus takes us home. And then the two prophets, the 144,000, the tribulation saints, they will also preach the gospel. And the angels of God, they will do the rest of the work during the tribulation period. You want well, to ask us? Yeah, it's going to be such a spiritual time that I think people will naturally just start believing in God because they will see, hold on, a rapture has happened. Yes. And now everything is very spiritual. There's things happening from the underworlds that are erected. Those will be exceptional times. So confirmation for non-believers and atheists will be there. Exactly. Plenty. It will be supernatural in nature. It will be the miracles, false miracles of the... Shortening of days. And oh, one after the other. Um, and this is where revelations becomes confirmed, confirmed, confirmed. Absolutely. Well, you cannot deny it anymore. Absolutely. 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 Um, we move to the second false doctrine. And that is the doctrine of the um, uh, millennialism or um, uh, millennialists. That false, false doctrine. Basically what it says is that Jesus' return can happen at any time. Detail framework is not important. Israel is of no importance. And 1000 years reign of Christ is allegory for Christ's reign in the hearts of believers. Okay. Well, let me address this one now. Firstly, I'd like to say that did you know that two thirds of the Bible is actually uh, Two-thirds of the Bible is direct and indirect prophecies. So I wonder when they say that uh, detailed framework is not important. Wasn't there detailed framework about his first coming? That he will be born in Bethlehem? That he will be born a virgin? That he will be born from the tribe of Judah? And on and on that you come in Jerusalem on a donkey's colt and so many prophecies for his first coming and they were very precise, very precise framework. So really this argument falls away. Israel is of no importance. Okay. Um, but let me address uh, the first one of prophecy. I want to bring Matthew 24 verse 32 and 33. Now Jesus speaking. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you see, shall see all these things, which things? Exactly the whole discourse of the end times that he preaches in Matthew 24. Know that it is near right to the door. You see now, Jesus advised us to look at those signs so that we know exactly the generation of his return. Um, now let's move to uh, Israel of being of no importance whatsoever. And I'm going to read for you Zechariah 14 verse 16. It reads, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. How interesting. All the nations that came against Jerusalem, which battle is that? Yes, you guessed right. It's the Armageddon battle. They came at the valley of Megiddo to try and defeat the Lord when he was returning in Jerusalem. And uh, the Lord defeated them. And it says that every year they shall come to worship the Lord from Jerusalem. <laughs> so is it going to be the banner of the church on top of Jerusalem? No, it's going to be Israel, Jerusalem. Of course, the saints of God will be there with the internal bodies and the angels. But to say that Israel is no more, 
absolutely false and there is tons of scriptures by the way in the Bible about it. The third argument about the Millennium Kingdom being allegorical. In other words, Jesus is reigning in the hearts of men. Uh, you know, it annoys me that they want to completely remove the glory fully deserved by the Lord Jesus. He came as a lamb to suffer his first coming for us to redeem us. And when he returns as a king to reign for a thousand years, they want to rob him of, of that. And that is a church doctrine, brothers and sisters. They say there is no such a thing as he comes and defeats the counterfeit trinity. I've pointed the scriptures to you throughout the whole series. How he defeats the counterfeit trinity. He throws in, he throws in the lake of fire the false prophet and the antichrist. And suddenly there is allegory. Uh, and let's look at Revelation 20 verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, here's the question. If it's allegory, figure of speech, would it have really a set period of a thousand years? Definitely not. When God puts a specific numbers period, you cannot interpret it as allegory. Uh, so we've got exactly in this verse a thousand year period. And then we've got before that the first resurrection. Now, if they don't believe in a thousand years millennium, uh, then in that case, they don't believe in the first resurrection because it takes place before the thousand years. And if they don't believe in the first resurrection, then they might just well not believe in Jesus as well. Because Jesus promised to all believers the resurrection from the dead. Um, so, brothers and sisters, this is a very, very um, important to understand that the reign of Christ is eternal in the hearts of believers. It's not limited to a thousand years. You can, they cannot put it as an allegory. Don't fall prey to this sophisticated and they explain up and down, left, right and center with, they suck scriptures out of their thumbs to try and make it that it's what it's not. Don't fall for it. The scripture plainly says a thousand years reign of Christ, you rule them with an iron rod, you defeat his enemies and the first resurrection will happen before that. Hallelujah to God be the glory. Jesus comes as a King of Kings. Come Lord Jesus, we don't follow this false doctrine. All a millennialists repent, you are preaching false doctrine. Number three, we move to post-millennialism. Now that false doctrine states that Jesus' return and rapture will happen after 1000 years of peace on earth during the reign of the church. <laughs> Also, it states that Israel is of no importance and no great tribulation exists. Okay. Um, now, the argument for the thousand years reign of Christ, we already answered it in the previous one. So, I'm going to spare you the details of answering this one again. But this false doctrine now uh, states that the rapture and the return of Jesus is after a thousand years. And who reigns for a thousand years and makes peace on earth? The church. Wow! Have you noticed? When did the church get separated from the Lord? Right now, correct. But is Jesus really separated from us? Didn't he say when you did that for them, you did it for me? He is in us. And he is returning to reign with us for a thousand years, but that scripture is of no importance for this doctrine. Uh, it must wait a thousand years until the church reigns. Wow! You see what happened here? We replaced the glory of Jesus as the head of the church and we put us, the church, on top of Jesus. And we're going to reign, not you, Lord. We don't want you here. That's exactly um, what actually that doctrine teaches. It's absolute arrogance of whoever thought about this doctrine. False, false, false. I don't know how anyone, any sane believer who read the scriptures 
and the Bible even once can fall prey to death. Utter nonsense. Um, again, speaking of Israel is of no importance. We already addressed it. But I'll bring one scripture, Revelation 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones and they set upon them that and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay, no tribulation of such in that doctrine. Well, but then I wonder now, who are these that were beheaded? Who are these that were beheaded for not receiving the mark or worshipping the image? <laughs> Accepting it on their foreheads or their hands. And who are these that lived with the Christ and reigned for a thousand years? You see what, what, what I'm trying to say? Again, blatant scripture, they just simply removed it from their doctrine. No, no, this is something else. Okay. Uh, how can there be no great tribulation and no antichrist and no mark of the beast when the scripture plainly points to that? You see, the only way for that doctrine to work is if you simply erase that scripture completely from the Bible. I'll briefly mention the fourth doctrine, false doctrine, and that is that the rapture of the church and the return of Christ happen at the same time at the end of the tribulation. Okay, I'm not going to discuss this one because we addressed it in part 6a. Part 6a, the rapture of the church. All the arguments that the rapture does happen and it's a different event from the return of Christ at the end of the tribulation is there. Please go through it if, if you haven't watched it and your question, the question will be answered there. I'm going to end here by saying a few things here. False doctrine in general aim to either falsify scriptures to agree with their doctrine. Typical example is Jehovah Witness Bibles, uh, where they actually remove things to suit their doctrine. The Holy Spirit becomes the force of God. Jesus is not God, and wherever the Bible says he's God, they change it to mean something else. Or the second option is, if it's not to change the scripture, is to misinterpret the scriptures to mean something else. And their favorite ways is to allegorize them. Why most of the churches don't preach the book of Revelation? You know what is their favorite excuse? No, these are allegories and they're symbolic. You know, because why? Because it doesn't suit your doctrine. Very nice. Okay. In my personal opinion, it's a bit of both. They use misinterpretation of scripture but also they falsify scriptures sometimes, often all those who actually preach those false doctrines. Um, the favorite way to misinterpret scriptures I've already mentioned is to make them symbolic or in allegorical in nature. Then you can actually thumbsack any allegory or symbolism on them and for your doctrine becomes true. The most amazing book in the entire Bible, the book that connects the whole Bible together, that ends the Bible, ends all prophecies, the world as we know it ends and the glorious appearing of the King of Kings happen and the kingdom of God becomes the kingdom on, on earth is the book of Revelation. And that is the book that has been the most abused and misinterpreted for the, the reasons that I've already outlined. Please, brothers and sisters, defend the glory of our Lord Jesus. He came as a lamb, but he's returning as a king to judge his enemies. The glory belongs to him. He said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees that were putting him on trial, and you shall see me coming 
in the glory of my father with the clouds of heaven and they tore their clothes they refused to believe me. that glory belongs to jesus alone defend jesus some of you may say no he doesn't need defending well if you deny me i'll deny you didn't jesus say those words so brothers and sisters i'm not saying go and look for enemies to to fight no but when you have to stand up and especially when it comes from christians that just simply hear doctrines and believe them without actually searching the scriptures whether they speak so or not you defend the truth the glory belongs to jesus our lord loved us to come as a lamb with all the limitations as a human being to die a cruel death and now when his return is about to happen he wants his bride to stand up and say our redeemer lives and he's the king of kings and the lord of lords and he's returning for us bless you brothers and sisters until the next topic which will be part 11 index of the end times prophecies fulfilled um, there we're going to look into the prophecies that have been fulfilled the major prophecies in our generation very exciting one we're going to go through uh, some of those prophecies and uh, you will be equipped if they say no where is the end times prophecies fulfilled you're going to say yes here's the one here's another one i'm going to list all of those for you and specifically we're going to speak about the major ones that have been fulfilled with this i will end brothers and sisters we love you yeah, we love you god bless you guys god bless you ciao ciao